Ta-da! We are looking at a lot of plants in different stages of life. These are some of my plants, my Arabidopsis plants that are just drying, and then I'm going to collect seeds from them and uh, screen for transgenic seeds. Uh -huh. And come down this way. What I've been working on is looking at agrobacterium mediated transformation of plants, which is still the dominant way that we genetically engineer plants. And both trying to understand more of how it works. There's a lot of things that we use all the time. We don't actually know the nitty gritty of every step. And then also trying to address one of the big problems, which is that when we use this method of transformation, the new genes, the new DNA that we introduce in the plants, they integrate randomly in the plant genome. And so you can imagine that that could disrupt the function of native genes, you could integrate somewhere where the gene is not active. So you get a lot of variety in the phenotypes that you see, and so you know, one of the holy grails of plant engineering is can we do site specific integration? And we can't really do that until we also deal with this random integration pathway, and so what I'm trying to do is understand and measure how often that occurs and see if we can avoid that entirely. And then you can imagine applications for this with CRISPR where you can, in, for example, one generation, you can uh, achieve both your edits as well as prevent the integration of like their Cas9 genes and the guide RNA, which usually people will have to uh, cross out in another generation. I'm working to develop better tools to control when and where in the plant genes are expressed. So when we put in a gene into the plant for genetic engineering, we want it to be turned on or turned off in specific contexts, so either like in the leaves of the plant or the roots of the plant. Our ability to do this relies on a really small toolkit of parts that we have that we know are going to turn genes on in certain places. I'm hoping to use a lot of data that's come out of single cell sequencing to better design sequences that are going to control the expression of genes across the organism. In the Brophy Lab, we're trying to engineer plants and microbes for a sustainable future. And so what that means is developing really fundamental tools that haven't been developed yet to engineer plants and microbes that interact with plants to be more resilient to climate change, to be more productive, and to potentially serve as biofactories to produce things we need so that they can replace petroleum products. Let's start with the hyped and underhyped technologies. In industry, what are some overhyped ideas or companies, technologies you see? Thank you. One of the things that I think is being overhyped is CRISPR technology. I think a lot of people treat CRISPR as this silver bullet that's going to be able to engineer a plant to be however they want it to be. But being able to design genome edits that create the phenotypic changes that people want is very challenging. And a lot of the times, it's much simpler to use a genetic modification, a simple GM approach, to create the trait you're looking for. The advantage with CRISPR really only comes on the regulatory side, since a lot of agencies have essentially deregulated genetic changes made with CRISPR. So one thing that really came out maybe like a few years ago now is just cheaper sequencing has led to whole plasma sequencing. So before, you still needed to use primers and we needed Sanger sequencing and it was like limited by how many, like you only get 800 base pairs at once. It was kind of tedious if you had a really big plasmid, uh, which a lot of plant um, plant transformation plasmids are, and so you would just sequence like the genes of interest, and you completely miss what's on your backbone, and that can mutate over time. And so having been being able to do cheap whole plasmid sequencing has been, just made that a lot easier, and it has allowed us to surface a lot of um, carried over mutations that who knows where they came from. But for example, we found like you were like, oh, this like this this plasmid doesn't behave as I would expect, and it turns out there was a transposon in the um, resistance cassette. So. <laughs> Yeah, I think it's a really fantastic technology for just streamlining and making our processes in the lab much simpler. It's simpler, it's easier, and it's faster. So it allows us to get through more work more quickly. Uh, tell us about your PhD, Alex. Yeah, so um, in my PhD, uh, which was at UC Riverside with Dr. Julia bailey Serres, I studied how rice uh, responds to drought stress. Um, and in the process of um, doing this experiments, um, I really found that I was lacking a lot of the tools that I would want to be able to um, genetically manipulate plants um, to, to do more experiments to understand what's happening. Um, and so one of my major motivations um, in joining the Brophy Lab is to build those tools and make it much easier to access the tools 
um, that I wish I had as a PhD student um, for the rest of the research community. And you, Vivian, um, what brought you to the Brophy Lab? What indeed. Um, so going into my PhD, I knew I wanted to work with, with plants. Um, and so I did my, this is my third rotation um, that I did. And I think I was just really motivated by the, like, as Alex mentioned, like the tools that she was developing that had, um, that no one had really done in plants. I think there's a lot of, um, uh, we say there's like a red sea, blue sea. So the red sea is red because there's competition from all the different fish, all the crowded fish swimming and uh, biting each other. Um, and, I, and I wanted to work in a blue sea where there's a lot of, like so much exploration where um, it's, n it's everyone's motivated, to, um, the competition is just like everyone's motivating each other to see what you can accomplish and not trying to um, scoop each other's papers. Um, and just, I've always been interested, I think like food security is, I mean if you don't have food you can literally, literally do nothing else. So I thought if I wanted to do something impactful uh, with my life, um, this would be a good place to start. That sense, what would you tell someone who's interested in plant synthetic biology but is unsure of whether to, you know, do a PhD in this field or not? Uh, choose a project that fits you. A lot of plant work um, still involves a lot of waiting, and so if you know that you're good at a like waiting and also like you know multitasking so you can stack a lot of projects at once, then um, then that's something you can do. If you know that you're that's not what you really, uh, you, you, you know, you want faster turnaround times, um, then perhaps you would look at something more computational or you would work more with like the microbes that, um, that interact with plants rather than plants themselves. So I think it's a lot of picking the project that's right for you. And then at the end of the day, always, always find a good work environment because um, you'll be miserable otherwise. I was um, fortunate in that um, Jen's lab had both an amazing mentor, amazing lab culture, and also work that I was really interested in. Um, so I kept myself fortunate in that. I think historically it's been really challenging to be a plant biologist um, with the real bias towards focus on biomedical research. Um, but I think that um, faced with climate change, um, I think that the world is realizing now how important plant science is. It's getting better in terms of the recognition for that. And I think that there's a lot of people out there that are super interested into moving into this area, but they have not um, taken the leap yet. And I think part of that is that there needs to be more opportunities. Um, and then the other part is um, just create the opportunities that you, you want to be there. So I think there's a lot of people who maybe haven't historically worked in, in, in plants in the past but have a research lab um, that might start working on plants in addition to animals or, or whatever else they're working on. The million dollar question of how can we shift people's perspective around GMOs? So I think that it's really important um, for us as plant biologists to um, demonstrate to the world how impactful our technologies can be um, and how valuable they can be um, to individuals. And so I think that um, the historical problem really arose from the sorts of uh, initial things that were deployed through genetic engineering, which were traits that were really important for farmers, which is uh, pest resistance from, from BT um, and herbicide uh, tolerance from uh, uh, glyphosate, um, which I think um, has led to a lot of the, really the majority of the negative sentiment around GMOs has come from this initial use case. Um, where it was a, a corporation that was selling a pesticide or herbicide um, and the genetics uh, material for the plant that was resistant to it. Um, and I think that inherently is a conflict, but additionally, um, it's not something that adds value on the consumer side. Um, so a consumer is going to prefer to avoid those, even though it's quite advantageous for the farmer. Um, and so I think some of the exciting things we're seeing now are really more consumer-oriented uh, foods and, and products um, and so there's lots of examples that have come out recently so there's the pink pineapple um, there are purple tomatoes um, and the glowing petunia um, and so I think more of these consumer oriented GM products um, will really help sway the general public um, I, and I think that also communication and honesty about where those products are coming from is essential to, to build that trust yeah I think actually it's a I think that's a big point is with CRISPR because it's um, 
sort of it's in a very weird regulatory state where you kind of don't have to report it. It's very like self-reported. Um, and so that allows, that gray area allows room for people to sow doubt because then you can imagine um, anti-GMO activists going out there like, oh, you don't know, but they've secretly put like this new sort of genetic engineering in the food system. And uh, yeah, it's like, uh, you know, making it seem very underhanded. Um, I think it is for scientists to be very upfront about like, this is what we can accomplish, this is what we cannot, these are maybe some of the downsides, this is what could happen. Um, is very important to get ahead of uh, to get ahead of the backlash, and then emphasizing I think the co uh, connections to, uh, to sustainability. I think especially with the new, I think that's why we see more, as Alex mentioned, more people interested in this in this space is that people are more interested in sustainability and just emphasizing all the ways that GMOs can uh, lead to a sustainable future and can do things that you cannot get to any other way or it would be would take a very long time, uh, um, I think would be very important. So more airdrops that are growing, I'm going to transform them. So once they get to about this stage, we can do what's called flower dip. So you dip these little flowers that have the plant egg cells in them into a solution for agrobacterium. And the agrobacterium transfers its DNA into that cell. And then it becomes, uh, that you can collect the seeds and then you screen for transgenic seeds. And then if you come this way, this is actually our neighbor lab. I think those are tobacco, I want to say. Maybe. Yeah, he's doing cell cultures, so it's suspension, cell suspension, which is another sort of like people trying to do more high throughput uh, experiments with plants. Instead of having to wait for, you know, this growth, you can do it uh, with cell culture. Maybe try to do, you know, you can do, you can still do agrobacterium media transformation with those. You can do like transfections that people do now. So sometimes we grow, we need to do, um, we need to keep them sterile. And so we, we grow them on plates. And then this allows us to, you know, do, to measure different phenotypes, different media conditions, put bacteria on them, um, while keeping them all in this like, nice contained environment. What are you engineering these to be? So some of these are, I think, engineered to like, change their lateral root density, so changing the root architecture. Mm -hmm. um, oh, that's mine. I didn't really need to take that out. OK. Um, and then that's, don't remember what that is. Yeah, a lot of these, I think, are for root architecture. And then this is our, so that's actually something that I infiltrated. So that's um, a relative of tobacco. So it's Nicotiana benthamiana. And so instead of uh, another way of doing like a high through, like a transient fast assay, is we just, in, we literally inject the agrobacterium solution into the leaves and then they can also transform the leaf cells. Um, and that gets us a, a, like a very fast, you know, you don't have to wait three to five days to see like, oh, is my fluorescent protein working? Uh, am I getting the products that I want? Like, am I getting, is this promoter working the way I want it to? So that we don't have to wait, you know, months for the Arabidopsis. Can you do that using the... Um, the plate reader, yeah. yeah and so we can just take little, little leaf punches and put them in a 96 wall plate and then can plop them into the plate reader and, um, and then that's how we can test for fluorescence. So then that's, you can compare like, for example, um, uh, like is this promoter acting the way I want it to? Is this repressor working the way I want it to? Great. So it's very neat. Mm -hmm. You can see the benchwork, some of that? Yeah, I can see okay. some of the benchwork. Yeah, you can see someone's seeds over there. Um, this, most of it is like a normal cloning lab, just with a si occasionally with a side of a lot of plants. And so uh, this is just a waiting gathering. And then this is not my research, but meet Admiral Akbar because it's a trap <laughs> and because it's, it's, a, it's a carnivorous plant. So it's, it's, got, it's trapped a bunch of little oh, flies. Nice. Yeah, and it, has, it gave it enough nitrogen source to make, another, make a new flower. That's really crazy pretty. It does not look like a. It doesn't, right? Yeah. I was so yeah, surprised. It is a mm -hmm. trap. Yeah. 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 <laughs> <laughs> When we're uh, screening for transgenic seeds, we're looking for, so one of the markers that we use is a fluorescent protein marker. And so for example, this is a really strong red fluorescence protein marker. And you can see that um, it's just really easy to see <laughs> whether or not the DNA got, in, got into the seed. And so this we know, like all the other ones are probably wall type. And then this one uh, we can select 
uh, to, to grow up and then work with. What you see here is actually, so some of the Nicotiana bentamiana that I had infiltrated, I can, we can look at the leaves under the wide field microscope, you can actually see that um, these are the, these are individual cells, so we call these pavement cells uh, here, like this okay. big circle here. That's so you can the actually, cell nucleus? Yes, wow, I believe crazy. so, yeah. <laughs> this is um, a uh, software tool that allows you to look at uh, the gene constructs that you are, you know, that you're making plasmids from, um, and then you eventually you'll transform into a bacteria, and then use that to transform, in our case, transform into, uh, transform into plants. And so you can see like the different parts, so there's a promoter to drive transcription, um, and then this is actually an enzyme that I'm using to make the plant produce a certain chemical compound. You've got the terminator to end transcription. You've got some uh, markers, so this is our cherry fluorescent marker uh, to show that the transformation worked. Um, and you have here just um, uh, antibiotic resistant for the microbe so that we can select for the E. coli as we're, as we're, when we're cloning. So, pretty basic. <laughs> <laughs> this is very nitty gritty. <laughs> when I said that people don't understand, like we actually don't know a lot of how the agarbiter media transformation works. What I mean also is that a lot of the research was done like in the nineteen eighties, and then things just get carried carried down. You know, like your postdoc did something and they trained you to do things one way, and so some of the DNA sequences that we use are just very legacy, and don't know where they came from. And so this is just me trying to trace back like where they where they actually got it from. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Continuing from CRISPR, actually, there's also a matter of what are you using the CRISPR for? When you're trying to engineer something, like what are you doing it for? Actually, a colleague of mine, she worked at a company where they were engineering strawberries to be more sweet, which is cool, but like neither of us think that strawberries need to be that much more sweet, so what are you actually engineering it for? And then thinking about CRISPR specifically, there's a company that's been able to uh, remove the bitter compounds from a bitter green, and then and they said their, uh, their motivation was uh, primarily to in, to increase the diversity of leafy greens that are available in the American market. And my immediate thought was like, have you ever walked into a Chinese supermarket? Because we have so much variety. Um, and I'm all for, I'm not one of those people who say like, oh, like mother nature knows best, but mother nature has provided a lot of variety. And I don't think there's a, I don't think we need to reinvent the wheel when it comes to, when it comes to certain things. So, you know, look, look what, it, what it's out there first and see if you can uh, work with those instead of perhaps tr jumping immediately to thinking about like, oh, how can we like what can we engineer and let's go to the um, what's the technology you'd bring from the future into the present like a plant in biotechnology so i don't know if the future will ever produce this but i've had a pet i've had a pet i don't know just like engineer plant idea since pro i guess it went back to went back to high school oh no, back to college when I was in fantasy writing workshop. <laughs> and I thought, how great would it be that if we could have a tree of life that we could use to grow babies, right? Infertility is an issue, maternal mortality is an issue, and just the fact that you know, like there's nine months of your life where you can like you're not functioning like, like how you're used to functioning. And it would be cool if we could leverage plant ovaries. Um, to uh, to do this for us instead, and I think it'd be really I think it'd be really cute and pretty. Like, <laughs> to have a, like a magnolia tree <laughs> producing, um, incubating your babies, which I know I, you know I can. Talk this, about, uh, like how it would change the way people perceive women. Society. Yeah, I mean, I think it's like actually this evolved from what uh, from me thinking like, what kind of magical system would you need to truly have gender equality, right? And I thought, you know, you could have if you could if you could just wave your hand and something could happen, then like I think like the male advantage and strength historically would be less of a big deal. But there's always always the fundamental like the woman is the person who carries the child, um, and this would solve that, and perhaps it would lead to true gender equality. I don't have to go too far into the future. I think to to that far <laughs> to identify a technology that yeah. I'm excited about. I um, mean, it's actually a technology that Vivian mentioned that her work is relevant towards. But being able to drag and drop a piece of DNA into a plant genome exactly where we want it, um, in a method that's routine and easy and and uh, consistent. Um, is something that I think is really, really essential and will really um, dramatically advance plant genome engineering.